there we go. So uh, thanks for coming tonight, and uh, I'm going to speak about another um, lab-related process for the arts uh, taking place on another campus, this time in Switzerland. I work for EPFL, which was one of the two uh, big uh, polytechnical institutes in Switzerland, Zurich and Lausanne. Lausanne being the, the, the sort of smaller sister to Zurich, but uh, quite uh, in quite a bit of a development these uh, last few years. And especially on the new frontier for the school, which is this intersection of uh, culture and technology projects on the on, on campus. The way we came to um, to deal with culture on this campus is basically through a couple of uh, sort of applied research projects in the field of culture, where we were asked by uh, various partners to digitize their cultural heritage. And this took us through several steps that are similar across projects that could seem quite different from each other. The first one we started uh, about eight years ago now is what we call the Montreux Jazz Digital Project, which is a massive digitization project of the entire concert archive of the Montreux Jazz Festival. It's a pretty unique festival. Uh, started in 1967, probably the longest running jazz festival in Europe, and the only one to have recorded and filmed the totality of the concerts that happened there. So massive archive, massive complexity of formats, videotapes, uh, all kept in single copies since the late 60s, etc. The school uh, went through this project to uh, harmonize this archive into a digital version, make the archive more and more searchable. Uh, and of course, there was a question popping up with this archive, where do you display this type of content once you have made it harmonized and you've made it searchable. I'll come back to that later. Another project we've uh, been doing for now maybe three or four years is a project we call the Venice Time Machine, which is it's a totally different subject matter than the jazz archive we're dealing with. It's a totally different matter than a lot of other big data projects going on on campus. But it's basically the same thing. You have a very complex topic, in this case 100 years of history as preserved in the state archives of Venice, that you have to go through. It's basically a thousand years of manuscripts, basically, where the whole history of the city is written down, that you have to digitize, organize, and again, then bring back to an audience. So it's a very special project. And uh, with these two projects, you see sort of a similarity in the way uh, that we can intersect our knowledge uh, on this scientific campus with different types of cultural heritage. And I'm sure you will, you will see probably uh, Laurent also from Google will speak about digitization, organization, and publishing of data. This is pretty much the same thing. These steps that we can do with any type of cultural heritage, uh, bringing in our, our digital technologies uh, to them, is really to go from raw acquisition processes through to integration of the data we create uh, by doing this, and then asking questions about restitution. How do we provide uh, an audience with the means of exploration? What types of experiences do we provide? And in what types of spaces? So these are the questions that we're asking. I'll, and, and of course, then this will lead us also to building spaces to host these programs. I'll come back on that later. Maybe just to have a look at what, what it actually means um, uh, in terms of the, the, the steps you have to take for these intersection of digital technologies and specific cultural heritage. I'll just walk you through a few steps of our Venice project. Uh, if this starts, there we go. Uh, sorry, just gonna go back to the previous one. Sorry about that. So typically, if you, if you do a project like this in the city of Venice, for example, you're confronted with very complex paper archives. Here, we're in the Fondazione Cini in Venice, which is the biggest repository of Venice-related artworks in the world. They have about a million and a half images of artworks stored there, which is probably about five times what you would find already digitized on the web related to artworks being produced in Venice. So our teams are in there, they're scanning all this, which means that they develop a whole range of scanning machines to do this. Here you have a 360, uh, 360 degree rotating scanner that sort of goes through in a much faster and an actually pretty playful way all of the documents in the archive. That's one example of what we do. And then when you switch to the State Archive of Venice, you find these sort of more classical 
types of scanners where you just flatten a document, you scan it page by page, and you can have the same types of models for then large scale prints where we work with wall scanning uh, types of uh, types of documents. Um, so this is just one sort of beginning of, uh, of a process of interaction with this type of cultural material, and it's actually accompanied by a lot of div other scanning processes. We also take inspiration, for example, from neuroscience to actually scan books and manuscripts without opening them, sort of doing MRI scans but applied to books. So there's a whole bunch of challenges there that are stacked up. And once we have uh, sort of made our way through this material that we have scanned all this content, that we have learned to read the contents, we are slowly building a model made out of these data acquired that allows us to then uh, sort of do a, a full walk through the data, this historical data of Venice throughout the ages. Here's an example again, uh, if I can start this, sorry. Sorry about the formats. Wow. So this is typically the type of walk through the, the historical data of the city you could have. Here you have Venice, a representation 2016. You take the square of the San Giacometto right next to the Rialto Bridge, and you convert this contemporary city in a series of data points that you can then zoom through the ages and basically connect to any type of visual material throughout the ages, pictorial representations of that, of that building, any other information, and zoom it through and sort of make that related to the rest of the city. You can take then another reference, a, a cadastral plan uh, from the 1800s, take a specific business that's in there, isolate it, then correlate it with tax documents of the city of Venice, identify that building, identify an owner, identify workers uh, in the same building 100 years before, and so forth. So you create this sort of crazy model where all of the, these data points that you have collected in your archive um, basically creates an entire picture of the of, of the city and where basically you end up with and here there you go you start again with another element of the city and you basically end up with this 4D model of the city where you have a complete three-dimensional representation plus of course a time cursor that you can basically put anywhere into these 1000 years so that's one project that we do and that shows you a few of the uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, challenges that we face and also what it shows is that um, what we can do with these types of projects is that starting from a contemporary area that is basically completely digitized, where all of us document pretty much everything we do instantly, uh, let's say, I don't know, maybe this conference doesn't even happen if it's not documented on Instagram and so forth. Um, so you have a whole range of digital information and you, you go back in time, of course, there's less and less of that. Then you can digitize documents, which we're doing, what, which is what we're doing in Venice, digitization processes. And you add to that simulation because there will always be points that you don't know. But if you have enough points, enough historical data points that you know about, you can sort of figure out what the rest is about and you can connect and you can have a functioning model. So this is a reasoning that applies to this Venice project. It applies totally to this Montreux Jazz digital archive project. It applies to other types of heritage. We have a big project on campus called the Human Brain Project, which is a full digitization program of the human brain. It's pretty much the same thing. So this is sort of what we, what we have on campus. And now these scientific construction sites, in a way, they're now joined by an actual physical construction site on the campus. We're building, we're working with uh, the Japanese architect Kengo Kuma on developing a culture and technology center on the campus. So a place where we can conduct exhibitions and other types of programs, which can actually show what we do in these programs. And which also take that last step, this step of um, basically the experience of projects and say, okay, we need to also test this on campus. The two other steps, acquiring the data, modeling the data is something that you can easily do in the lab among the scientists sitting in your in your server towers and so forth. But if you want to go one more step and you want to ask, how do I exhibit this content? How do I bring it up to an audience? You need to be able to test this with the audience on campus. So this is why we're building this uh, this construction here, uh, which will soon be finished and, and open in November of this year. 
so here's uh, Kumasan visiting the campus last May. So that's that's a funny process. So we're basically in all these science processes and building up these science projects, and at the same time we're in the middle of a typical construction process of a building. We have uh, whatever our discussions, we have our planning, we have our small accidents also on campus. Just yesterday we had a uh, a forklift spill hydraulic oil all over one of the pavilions, and we have. Uh, uh, while we were installing this exhibition, which in this part of Switzerland is nice because you get the Tangeli cleaning services to show up and uh, and clean up for you. So this is a sort of an uncommissioned performance by Mr. Tangeli. We're pretty happy about that. Um, so what we will do in this building is basically some of the spaces we offer there are directly related to these uh, science programs that I was uh, that I was describing. They're uh, they're basically active test grounds for the technologies that go into these programs. They benefit from the feedback of an audience, and um, and also they sometimes exhibit the science projects per se to provide a basis of discussion for uh, art and technology interfaces at large. So that's very important for us. Here are a few images of what these inside spaces will look like. And some of the exhibitions we're working on. Uh, in November, we'll open one of the spaces will open with an exhibition dedicated to Pierre Soulage, the French painter who's mostly known for his outre noir, ultra black types of paintings, which are a challenge for any digitization processes. Typically, here you see two huge black rectangles. That's actually two soulages in the back. They don't come at all on this uh, on this screen in this resolution and so forth. Huge challenges for digitization, for arrangement of the data, and again for exhibitions. So this is again one of these uh, these examples we're working on. Um, other spaces where we will present the Venice Time Machine, where we will we'll present the Blue Brain project, and at the same time where we will experiment with data produced by the school to apply um, typical processes that you find in these cultural big data programs, such as data visualization, to the school itself. So it's a pretty complex whole uh, with a whole lot of different parts, but it's all there to sort of provide us with a platform of discussion of these digital culture topics on campus. And at the same time, it's there to really provide us with a public laboratory on campus for uh, basically exhibition strategies and any other outreach component related to um, these types of uh, components. It's um, it's basically why why we want to do this is really that for, for uh, in our sense it's really important to have this physical platform on campus so that you can experiment and possibly come up with solutions for cultural heritage that are uh, beneficial uh, downstream to typical uh, traditional cultural institutions, but that um, but where basically we can experiment without the pressure of delivering a specific definite result at any given point in time, where we don't have the pressure of satisfying a paying audience. We need an audience, but we invite them to come and experiment with us. And that's a very important element, I think, if there is a future for the museums. It is also a sort of atomized future where they have to work hand in hand with institutions that are in other domains, that are basically research infrastructure, that are uh, dotted with this infrastructure, and that can help them with sort of take up the burden of experimentation for them. That's a very important point. Thank you.